I'd say a lot of my motion I based off of Jacob DeGrom and his like tempo and his delivery. Like he, he pitches like he's almost like he throws like low 90s, like he has to be crafty, like just to get people off balance. But then it's 98 to 101 consistently with a ton of carry. He's missing bats every time. It's 13 strikeouts per night every, every single outing. It's, it's just so fun to watch. Yeah. I didn't want to make that comparison to Jacob deGrom, but you know, when you got, when you line yourselves up, you pretty much have the same motion. It's that slow controlled wind up and delivery. And then it's just flying out of the hand at hundred and the slider, you know, low nineties. Through the first five hitter. Slider, the change, the quick pitch. Welcome to the Couch GM Podcast. A great episode today as I have on Noble Meyer, who is the Miami Marlins number one overall prospect in their system. He was drafted 10th overall by the Marlins in the 2023 MLB draft. And as we get into in this podcast, his ceiling is quite high. We go through his story up to this point, including some behind the scenes of his draft day in Seattle, Washington. We also get into his first exposure in professional baseball once he got down to Florida and talk through that insane rotation that the Miami Marlins have in their depth at starting pitching and that rotation that he might be pitching in relatively soon. A big shout out to Northwest Sports Management Group who is located here in Vancouver, Washington. They represent Noble Meyer and were able to make this podcast happen. They also represent some other high tier athletes that will be getting on the podcast in the near future. Also a big shout out to Playmaker Sports Bar and Grill located in Ridgefield, Battleground and Vancouver, Washington for being the official watch spot of the Couch GM for this upcoming season. And as always, if you'd like to support the Couch GM brand, make sure to like and subscribe on YouTube. If you're listening to the audio version, make sure to give us a five-star review. And of course, if you're thinking of buying, selling, or refinancing in the Pacific Northwest, I am a mortgage lender during the day. So reach out to the Couch GM to hit a home run with your mortgage financing needs. And with that, let's get into the podcast. All right, welcome to the Couch GM podcast. Today I have on Marlins top prospect, Noble Meyer, drafted 10th overall in the 2023 MLB draft. So first off, Noble, really appreciate you taking the time today. Of course. We're getting close to like two weeks, two to three weeks until you report to Florida. Um, do you have a, a report date that you're heading down and how has your off season been so far? Uh, yeah, I do have a report date. I'll be down there February 12th and off season has been great. I uh, put on like, 10 almost 15 pounds since uh off season hit and like gotten a lot stronger um i'm ramping up the velo right now and yeah i'm, I'm excited for this next season what's your uh go-to meal bin with your with your bulk you're on um culver's chicken sandwich uh it's kind of i don't think they have any up in seattle or up in uh, the washington area or oregon but it's like that midwestern um, kind of like a Dairy Queen, but their chicken sandwiches are like not terrible for you, and they're pretty high calorie. And I've been crushing them. Awesome, yeah. So I definitely like to get into your off season and what that routine has looked like. But first, I want to start back with your childhood, growing up, and how you got into sports and baseball. So um, you you might know I'm in Vancouver, Washington, just across the river from where you grew up, West Lynn, Portland area. So walk me through your, your upbringing and how you got into sports initially into baseball and what that looked like. Yeah. Grew up uh, in Westland, a uh, handful of miles South of uh, Portland. Um, and my dad, he never played or he played baseball for a little bit, like growing up, but no, I don't think he even played in high school. Um, he was big into tennis and basketball and, but he was a big baseball fan. And when I was growing up, he introduced me to T-ball and like playing with a ball in the backyard while my mom was taking care of my brother. And that's kind of where I started to really like love baseball, just playing with a ball. Um, and then, yeah, growing up, played T-ball. And uh, eventually, once I was 10, I had an opportunity to play for an ex-major leaguer, Trevor Wilson. And with his son, Paul Wilson, who this past year got drafted to the Tigers in the third round. Um, yeah, when I was 10, up until I was, when was it, 16, 15 or 16, I played with uh, Paul and Trevor Wilson, and Paul and I became best friends, still are, and he, Paul was always incredible at baseball. He was, like, throwing 10, 15 miles an hour harder than everybody in middle school, and he's the kid you didn't want to face because he was yeah. terrifyingly good, 
and I always wanted to be as, as good as him. And I just wanted to like catch up so we could like live out a dream of playing in the major leagues together. And once high school hit, I really started to hit a bunch of growth spurts. And that's kind of when that, that dream really became like, oh, like this, this could be very real. And yeah, throughout high school, like I just, I kept getting bigger, kept getting stronger, really obsessed over, over my mechanics. And like, next thing you know, I'm throwing 95. I get invited to the PDP circuit out in North Carolina and there I hit 98. And that's kind of when I like jumped onto the scene as like the potential top high school pick or top high school um, pitcher. And yeah, uh, once draft came, I mean, that was pretty surreal. And yeah, and then my family moved out to Arizona now. So I've been okay. training out here in the hot weather. Don't have to worry about it. Get outside playing catch all the time instead of yeah. indoors. A little better than a, a Oregon weather. But um, yeah, yeah, it's great down here. Cool. So it sounds like Paul was a little bit ahead of you growing up. And then at what point did you, you know, meet his level and then maybe exceed it at some point? I think it was sophomore year where I kind of, I caught up to him in VLO where he hit 90, he was at 90 and he was kind of stuck at 90 for all of his freshman year, like over that, that quarantine era. Mm -hmm. Quarantine, like when COVID hit is really when I made like the biggest strides because I kind of just was able to sit down and only focus on like just getting stronger. Um, Cause I mean, I couldn't really do much else. Um, and then yeah, our, our sophomore year, I hit 92 and he hit 91. So that was kind of the first time I got ever thrown harder than him. Okay. Then he jumped back up. He hit like 95 later that year. And I was like, Oh, okay. Jeez. Um, and I was at 94. Then junior year is kind of when it all like separated where I was 95 the whole year. He was also throwing 95. I think he hit 96 in high school. So he threw harder in high school. Then that summer hit and I hit 98. And that's kind of when I like, had that big uptick and then eventually I kept going up to even 101 in one of my bullpens or 101 yeah. sorry, in one of my senior high school games. I had a hundred later that year. I saw a uh, picture of an iPad to where it, yeah, it was like a hundred point something. Yeah. I think that was when you were at U of O or something like that. Um, no, or that was actually up in Vancouver. That was uh, okay. the Northwest athletic center. It's where okay, yep. Northwest futures trains. Um, yeah. I was throwing a bullpen. I honestly didn't even feel good that day. And I just, I was throwing and then realized, oh, wow, I'm like sitting 98 right now. And I ramped a few up. I'd never hit 99 before. And my, my, I hit 100.2, started jumping up and down because like <laughs> I hit 100. Like that's ridiculous. That's a wild number. Like, yeah, it was a lifelong dream. Like I never would have thought I'd be able to throw 100 miles an hour. And, yeah, I hit 100.2 before I hit 99, which was pretty funny. And then the very next pitch was 99, so <laughs> all works out. Skip right over it. Yeah. So now, so now going back to your childhood, it sounds like you only played baseball growing up. Is that right? Basketball and okay. kind, kind of soccer. I didn't, I, not very competitively, just kind of the rec league where you run around and chase the ball. Okay. And then, you know, growing up, growing up in Portland, the closest team was the Mariners. Which team, if any, were you watching and paying attention to growing up? I was a huge Mariners fan growing up. My okay. dad took me to probably 30 games throughout my childhood. Like I, I grew up a big Felix Hernandez fan. I loved Ichiro. Um, one of my favorite Mariners even though I, I don't know if people know him as Mariner, but Raul Ibanez, because oh, yeah. every time every time I was there, he was always two for three with a double and a home run. So he, he slowly became my favorite player. And yeah, I've, I've always followed them. I'm still a fan. Yeah. Yeah. And then were there any pitchers that you were watching growing up? And were you focusing on pitching from a young age? Like, hey, I want to be a pitcher. Or was it just, I want to play in baseball? I really just wanted to play baseball. I was a big uh, Felix fan. And um, I also like Fernando Rodney, James Pact, uh, Paxton was a, mm -hmm. was cool. Um, was it Mike Montgomery, I think. I got assigned baseball by him, so I was a huge fan of him. Um, but really, really, if they were a Mariners pitcher, I liked them. Yeah. And then growing up, you know, when you started to figure out your pitching motion, how, how to throw the ball, 
did you kind of develop it around watching certain guys or was it just what felt natural and what the pitching coaches were telling you with the vice? Um, it was kind of a bit of everything. Like I kind of just gathered all the knowledge I had and tried to put it into one big collection of just how to throw a ball. Um, like certain tips and tricks I took from uh, different players. Like I'd say a lot of my motion I've based off of Jacob DeGrom and his like uh, tempo and his delivery. And then there's certain things I've taken from like, I don't know, Garrett Cole or just really any pitcher. Like I, I see, try and like look for things that make them stand out and try and incorporate that into my delivery. Yeah. I didn't want to make that comparison to Jacob DeGrom, but you know, when you got, when you line yourselves up, you pretty much have the same motion It's that slow, you know, controlled wind up and delivery. And then it's just flying out of the hand at hundred and the slider, you know, low nineties growing up so you go into middle school you get into high school you mentioned that you started to grow at that point when did you start playing in the various showcases and when did you start to notice that you were starting to get some looks um looks as in like collegiate or professional i guess both because you committed to the to u of o so i want to, I want to right. get into what that process looked like too yeah um as far as u of o my like when when COVID hit i was throwing like 77 like i was I was six foot, 145 pounds, like just a twig. And throughout COVID, I got way stronger. I put on 30, 40 pounds, come out of it about 180. Uh, that like that August after what August of 2020. And towards the end of August, I go down to Georgia because I got an invite to the PBR futures games where it's kind of like that showcase for like the top uncommitted guys. And there I like almost randomly jumped up to like 87 or 88 miles an hour. And that's kind of when I got started getting looks from colleges. And it was a, I, I kind of consider it a, a fraudulent 87, 88, because it was it, not that it was a, wasn't 88, but just I wasn't spinning it very well. Uh, they're pretty much like bad cutters. So they're just, they're barrel finder fastballs. Um, I didn't have an off speed, so it was like, I don't know, not, not, a, not a quality 88. So I kind of tried to reinvent that and make it to where like I'm throwing fastballs that like have high spin efficiency, right. they spin well, they move a lot. And I actually have a secondary that I can go off of. And that's ultimately where I developed my slider that has become my favorite pitch. Um, but yeah, after that. After that event, um, Oregon reached out, Washington State, uh, Oregon State a week or two after that, and Stanford and Harvard, just because I went to Jesuit private school up in Oregon. Um, and yeah, eventually I, I found Oregon was the best fit. The facilities were amazing. The coaches were incredible. It was hour and 45 minute drive from home so it wasn't bad at all um sponsored by nike <laughs> that too that was pretty nice yeah um yeah and then after that like still maintain a great rapport with the uh with the coaches but as far as pro looks um year after that i was getting 92 93 and the scouts are taking notice of it because i'm getting a lot of strikeouts and I'm not walk walking many people and they come over to like their field like what, that i'm playing with uh, for my club team and they're like oh wait this this kid's not bad so they kind of just kept an eye on me and uh, that junior summer is really when that kind of blew up where i got a pdp and all of a sudden i'm 98 throwing the hardest in the class or i guess tied for the hardest at that point I think there's three different guys at 98, but really, really blew up on the on the scene. And all of a sudden, like scouts, like oh, it's potential first high school pitcher taken off the board, potential first high schooler taken off the board. But um, yeah, that was kind of when I started to get the the big looks. And then over the span of the next year, it was just focus on like refining like the different aspects of the game, like fastball command, making sure my fastball is not like super flat and hittable because i mean that, that was sometimes a problem i got a lot of run but sometimes it just found barrel but yeah 
Yeah. So you described initially your fastball, you know, it wasn't a quality 88 or 87 to where it had some cut to it. it seems like you're definitely an analytics guy and a numbers yeah. guy. So at what point did you start getting into the numbers? Was it at your freshman year of high school? And um, yeah, walk me through the process of what you're looking at. And as you've been developing your arsenal, you know, kind of walk us through the average fan, what it looks like and what, what your ideal arsenal is. So winter of 2020, right after that, uh, like event uh, down in Georgia was right when I started to like really dive in, deep into like the analytics and all of that, because I figured like getting strong is really going to help me so far. Like I'm going to need to know like what plays best and like, how am I going to take advantage of everything that's given to me? And numbers was kind of like. I've always been big with math and like science and all that. So it was very, it was immediately very interesting to me. Uh, mm -hmm. And I just loved it immediately because I, I would change something slightly and I'd look at the track man or rap soda or whatever I was using. And I'd try and understand like, okay, I changed this and the numbers are showing that this is different. Uh, how can I make this better? And I really, that's really how I've developed my slider. And now it's, I'm working on my fastball doing the same thing, trying to, keep a low arm slot while also getting a little more vert with my fastball to mm -hmm. kind of give it that approach where like that path is going to be here and I'm trying to get the ball to be coming in this way to make that swing and miss a lot more like a lot more pop up some more weak contact and like just swinging right under it yeah um yeah and right now fastball as far as uh, arsenal fastball mid to high 90s uh slider like mid 80s really high spin big sweeper um change up also around mid 80s occasionally up to 90 if i'm throwing hard that's just it, it's a ton of run uh slower than the fastball and a little bit of drop and then a uh, curveball that i've been working on for the past year so it's gotten pretty good that's kind of mid 70s maybe even low 70s <clears throat> and super high spin like i've thrown at like 3400 rpms and just that's kind of just more of a steal a strike pitch where it just looks like fastball out of the hand looks way over your head and just kind of drops in yeah do you have a baseball on you by chance um i should somewhere i do cool yeah let's go through your pitch grips and take a look at that yeah Forcing fastball. There we go. Forcing fastball. Um, slider. Okay. Yeah. Just it's it's kind of almost a cutter grip. Yeah. To where I'm holding it on the seams like it's that. Not like, like one cutter. of those extreme slider grips. Yeah, but I'm kind of almost tilting it like that to where I'm getting on the side of my fingers and just pulling mm. it through that way. Okay. Um, change up. Just offsetting and then using that this ring finger to just pull through like that and then curveball just kind of basic on the horseshoe and just kind of ripping down on top of it like that cool so with the uh the change up are you pronating at all or are you just kind yeah. of throwing it like a fastball okay you're pronating a little pronation right here and then trying to use this ring finger to kind not quite snap side. through but just be on the side and it's pulling across versus like pulling down okay yeah. Awesome. And then have you messed around with any additional pitches or do you plan to add any additional pitches? Uh, I've messed around with like a split change where it's like, it's yeah, yeah. very, very comfortable in my hand. Like uh, there's no tension and it's just right here. I'm just kind of pulling down that way. trying to get the one seam to just give it a little sink. Um, there's something in the works. I don't know if it's going to pan out, but yeah. Um, and then a cutter. Like, uh, okay. just something that's not the fastball, different shape, not a slider, just kind of in between to where I'm going to get weak contact, get easy outs that way I can work deeper into the game. Yeah. And since you follow the Mariners, you might know a little bit about this with Logan Gilbert learning, learning a splitter, Bryce Miller's right. learning a splitter, splitter this off season. And a big reason for that is because some pitchers with a pronation, they have a difficulty commanding that pitch and with the splitter, you're able to sit, stay behind the ball. It has right. the same type of movement, but you're you're just throwing it like a fastball. Yeah, that, that's interesting to hear. 
yeah, walk us through, you know, you start getting scouted by U of O, you commit there, you start to, um, you know, see a bunch of radar guns in the stands during your games. You start to figure, hey, this is, this might be happening. Walk us through going into that senior year. I don't know if you saw the player profile I made on you, but I was just trying to imagine myself being the average high school hitter, trying to just make varsity. And then you're hearing the leather popping. And it's like, what, what's that over there? It's like, I haven't heard that sound before. So yeah, walk us through your senior year to start. Yeah, um, senior year, game one was against uh, Skyview, I think, up in, okay. um, yeah, up in Vancouver. And that was over at University of Portland. And I had hit 100 in that game at some point <laughs> through like four innings, I think nine strikeouts. And that was the only game I had less than 10 strikeouts. Wow. And it's still nine through four. And after that, it was always... 12, 13, 12, 12, 13, 14. I think I had one. I had one with 60 in my junior year through six innings. That, that's. Did you average like I, five, six innings? Um, I think, Did yeah, I think I averaged, times? I think I averaged six. I went all seven, four times. Once, yeah, once against um, Calvary Christian, because we had a big uh, tournament over in North Carolina, that National High School Invitational. And Calvary Christian was the top team in the nation at the time. And we got matched up with them round one. And I went seven innings, uh, two runs. Now they're returned, but I mean, baseball happens. It's yeah. Yeah. There's errors. It's, it's bound to happen. I've come to terms with that. Uh, two hits and 10 strikeouts. And that was probably, I think one of the best games like that I've pitched in my life because like with how high the caliber team that was to go, all seven and like still come out like feeling like I did really well. I think that was really like probably one of, the, if not the best one, one of the best uh, games that I pitched. But as far as like complete games, high school state championship and two others against like our league rivals with um, two over in East or not East, West Portland uh, out by where we are. And yeah, like I, I'd, our, my coach would want not would want me to, like, oh yeah, we we've got a reliever ready, like, like you're 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 good. I just be like, no, I'll I'll stay in. <laughs> yeah, I want, I, this is my game. I want I want to finish this one. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was a it was a fun season. I've lost in the state championship, unfortunately, but um, yeah, uh, yeah, it was really fun. I I I miss high school ball sometimes, but. I mean, it's hard to say no to professional baseball. Right. Yeah. I mean, we'll get into in a bit kind of the the pitching environment that you're heading into with the Marlins. Mm -hmm. But in that senior year, you finished that out, you, you know, heading into the draft. What's that process like? Because I know you, you were up in Seattle for the draft, walking on the stage. Walk us through that month leading up to the draft, maybe some some of the combine or the interviews that you had. And then, you know, that day in Seattle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'll start with the Combine. Combine is super fun out here in Phoenix. Um, yeah, I had 10 interviews with, I think, teams picking from five through like 16, with the exception of two. Um, they were all wonder like great meetings. Like I got to talk with, sometimes it was the um, director of scouting. Sometimes like it was even the general manager that was there. Um, Every single one of them, they're great guys. Like, I, I, I've kind of realized, like, in the baseball community, like, it's it's hard to find somebody who just isn't a great person. Like, it's, I don't know what what it is. Maybe it's just how baseball humbles you. But uh, right. they, they seem to be a lot of great people and, like, just baseball in general. Um, but, yeah, Combine was great. I got to do a couple of the uh, physical activities, like vertical, broad jump, uh, it's a 30 yard dash, I think. Um, yeah, I, I enjoyed all of it. And yeah, interviews went really well. But after that, kind of just became like a big ball of stress that kept getting bigger because it's kind of weird not knowing where I'm going to go, especially with my family talking about moving to Arizona. I was hoping like a team that was that had spring training in Arizona yeah. that would be really ideal because I mean, we're. Right now we're 10 minutes from the Rangers Royals complex. So that would 
that would have been perfect going to the Rangers or the Royals. But I mean, I absolutely can't complain with the Marlins. The Marlins are, I mean, wonderful. They being out in Florida is definitely a change of scenery, and going from Oregon all the way out to the other side of the country, very other side of the country. <laughs> um it's hot and humid there but yeah. it's it's been wonderful there's tons of good people um but as far as the draft draft was draft day was very 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 stressful just not knowing like what's gonna happen not knowing where i'm gonna go because i'm i'm thinking like every pick like oh could like could this be me could this be me um who, who's this gonna be like just to keep myself distracted i was trying to guess who each pick would be and I was I got most of them right but yeah it was the, that whole span I think it was a, about a month in between when high school season ended and uh draft day it was just very chaotic just talking to scouts talking to my agent about like what teams are interested and yeah I'm glad that it happened but also kind of glad that it's over yeah right yeah you, you at least know what's in front of you and you yeah. can start working towards something yeah that it, it's great having like a, a concrete path set up for the next handful of years so at the mlb draft is it like you know on tv with the nfl draft where is that to where there's that room in the background there's the tables you're just different guys sitting at yeah. the tables and you're just waiting for your phone to ring. So were you alerted before the Marlins actually picked you that it was coming or was it when your name was called? Sort of. Uh, my agent called me and said, Hey, Marlins want you at 10. And I was, yeah, he's like, how does that sound? I'm like, absolutely. That sounds amazing. <laughs> and I, I wasn't a hundred percent sure. Cause I don't know if that was like, Oh, the Marlins want you like, are you okay with that? Or, or if it was like the Marlins are going to pick you. I like, I, I didn't, I couldn't tell the difference. Yeah. And so I got to the 10 and I was like, Oh, is this actually going to be my name or is it, am I getting thrown for a loop here? <laughs> and it ended up being my name, which is awesome. And that was, I hardly remember anything after that. Cause I was just in, just in euphoria. Yeah. Just black out, walk across the stage, shake the hand, put on yep. the jersey and the hat and you wake up the next day or in a couple hours, you're like, Oh wow, this is actually happening. Yeah, I, I, I got interviewed by um, Xavier Scruggs up on stage, and I can't remember a single word I said up there. <laughs> you have to go back to YouTube and watch it back. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. So then you get drafted, you walk off the stage. You know, what's that next day, the next week? Do you go down to uh, Miami immediately for that initial meeting? Uh, not quite. So I got to stay and watch the All-Star game the next day, which is oh, awesome. really awesome. It was a great game. Um, Home run derby too. Yep, that was cool. cool. Yeah. Uh, and I went down to. I uh, went back down to Portland to home for the next week and a half or so, for two weeks. And after that two weeks, went out to Florida to, or went out to Miami go watch a game and like, do that, publicity thing. And I got there in the suite with our second rounder, uh, Kemp Alderman and like show the camera on us like up on the screen like oh here's marlon's first and first and second rounder and then later or right before that signed um and got all of that out of the way and as soon as that game was over uh somebody drove us up to jupiter where the spring training complex is and okay. immediately camp and i started in a complex league the next day so it was, it was really quick Super quick, yeah. It was all a span of one day, or I guess two days. So I got there the day before. Get to Miami next day, the game, the signing, all of that. And after the game, just drive out to Jupiter and just start professional baseball. And that was lead up. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of a handful, but it, it's been fun. Do you recall who was starting pitching that day for the game that you went to? Would have been Braxton Garrett. Braxton Garrett. Yeah. How much of the Marlins? have you seen up to this point? And because if you look at the depth chart for the, for the Marlins, their starting rotation is going to be one of the best in baseball really for the next five plus years, like mm -hmm. one through five are just nasty guys. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Lozardo is ridiculous. He's, yeah. he's a monster. Alcantara when, when he's healthy and when he's back healthy, I'm, I'm 
Like I'm expecting a, another Cy Young season. Uh, Max Meyer, I got a chance to meet while he was rehabbing down in uh, or up in Jupiter, and awesome guy, and he's definitely going to be a stud. Um, who else they got? I mean, Braxton Garrett is legit. Thomas White, their t- comp pick w- in draft this past year, he's incredible. Lefty with he's already like sitting mid to high nines with like 20 inches of vert. Like he's not, not a fun catch partner. I'll say that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I'm very excited for the future of that. Yeah. And I mean, Edward Cabrera, he's got like a 95 mile an hour right. change up and then Yuri Perez, he comes up yeah. rookie year and he's Yuri, all these guys, Yuri. you know, are high nineties with yeah. just as disgusting off, off speed. Yeah. It's, it's ridiculous amount of potential. Just, just sitting there it's gonna be really exciting yeah and uh so thomas white was actually still there when the mariners one of their comp picks came up and i was really hoping that they would have taken him because just looking at the potential of that guy but for the marlins to be able to take you and thomas white the top two high school pitchers in the draft basically i mean that's that's pretty cool so you get down to playing in rookie ball it looks like you got in five games last year in your first exposure to, to or at least on the uh, stat sheet, five games. Yeah, five and five and single, I believe. I had two like short outings in a complex league, which were, I don't know, just I had first time throwing in like, what well, it would have been, two months, but they were yeah, it was kind of that introduction in the complex league, and then as soon as I jumped up to single A, that's when like that that was, like pitch clock, which was new, like oh, yeah. facing like professional hitters that are like up to three, four years older than me, even sometimes right. like 25. Like that's when it really started to like, Oh, here's like, <laughs> th- here's where it gets tough. Yeah. So walk me through your development or that learning curve that you started to experience that year. Yeah. Um, nothing like blew me out of the water immediately. Like I, I granted it's single a, it's kind of like the, the low, like low level of the minor leagues, like, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of assuming once I hit like maybe even high A, but like really double A and hopefully triple A at that point. Um, that's kind of when like I'm going to really start seeing like, oh, these guys are like incredible. Like these guys should be up in the pros. They're just still too young. Like yeah. that's when I'm, I'm really expecting like that's these guys are incredible. Um, but single A, like it was you throw strikes, you're probably going to get outs. And that kind of really displayed where a lot of our best starters were guys that are, I don't know, 80, 89 to 92, just good sync on it. And they just mm-hmm. command East West, just throw inside outside. And they just got outs. They had a one ERA, like those guys dominated. Yeah. Um, and then those guys that are like specifically our Latin guys where they're from 97 with like a good breaking ball. Those guys like super high strikeout rate high walk rate too like it's kind of there was a lot of raw talent and that was kind of like what stood out is you either have raw talent or you had guys that are very skilled and i think double a are going to be those guys that are raw talent and then have skill too and vice versa like with with guys that have skill they start getting stronger and then they build that like talent i guess they get stronger they throw harder they hit harder like things like that but i'm excited to see like what the development levels are going to look like like what that next step is to each uh each different level in the minor leagues yeah and then with some of those other draftees were you playing alongside them both at rookie ball and then an a ball like it was thomas white playing at the same time did you guys get moved up around the same time yeah um i got moved up to single a i think like five days before he did, or maybe a week. Like I, we played a series over in Port St. Lucie, about maybe 35 minutes away from Jupiter. Um, played in that series. I pitched in one of those games. And I, I believe next series, Tommy or Thomas was, um, he was with us by, by that point. So then heading into 2024, what have you been working this off season to, uh, to improve with your development? Um, if anything, yeah, um, like I said earlier, with the fastball shape, really trying to make like maintain a low attack angle or approach angle, 
uh, to where I'm missing bats. I can throw at the top of the zone and still get like like those pop ups. And then um, just getting stronger, being able to throw harder, maintain command. Command is really high priority for me, like being able to throw strikes because I, har I rarely walked anybody in high school. And when I start walking people, that's when it starts like, okay, that's really, it's, it's a direct correlation to just ERA inflation because like free bases, runner gets on, all of a sudden those hits that should have been nobody on is a hit with a runner on base. Now it's first and third versus guy on first or right. it was a second ago. So yeah, that's kind of main priority is just being able to throw strikes. Um, and then once I'm able to throw strikes, throwing where I want, like inside, outside, hitting spot, uh, top of the zone, bottom of the zone, change of command, slider command, all that, that comes, I don't want to say it comes second because obviously that's important, but like throwing strikes is number one. Yeah. And as you mentioned, it's kind of like a compound effect. Once you start allowing base runners, it compounds on itself and that's when the ERA race starts to blow up. Yeah. And like with the Mariners again, you know, their, their slogan is dominate the zone. And yeah. so if you're just living in the zone, get that first strike, then yeah. the, the numbers are so much better for pitchers. Yeah. Um, and then walk, so walk me through your off season routine workouts. I'm curious, you know, what type of drills you do to dial in command? Do you just kind of pull back a little bit on the velocity and trying to, you know, throw hundred percent? Are you sitting 80%? And then you're just trying to spot it up in the off season. I think um, biggest thing for command is catch play and just focusing okay. on hitting a spot and catch play, like having your partner hold the target just right here and okay. just work on just hitting that spot over and over again, or just moving it to the other side, just playing, playing that game where like you have the glove, like chest is two points and head is three points and mm -hmm. first to 15 wins like that. Those, those kind of games, like it's, it sounds simple. It sounds rudimentary, but like it's, it'll really like really help with command and just like being able to hit a spot like when you need it or just throw it over the plate. Um, and then obviously when you get off the mound, just working on like splitting the plate into halves, like here's outside fastball, here's inside fastball, here's slider off the plate, here's slider, like backdoor slider, slider on the plate, like just those, those kind of things where like it, it doesn't sound too complicated but in the long run that's really going to help just just by practicing that over and over again and then are, are you playing long toss throughout the off season or you know you mentioned at the beginning that you're starting to ramp velocity back up so what does that yeah. look like um yeah just getting back into it starting to like work up my intent levels and in bullpens and like working on just speeding up my body again getting ready to get off the mound and like when facing hitters, like getting ready to really start treating it as if it were like in season to where I'm like, I gotta be physically ready. Yeah. And then walk me through from start to start, like your recovery, what that looked like that process in high school, you get done with the start. Do you ice your arm immediately? You know, what, what do those next few days look, look like? Yeah. Um, so I guess for the sake of the description, um, my games were, uh, or the games I was pitching in were Fridays uh, this past like season. Um, Saturday is going to be super light throwing. Sometimes, depending on how I feel and how much I threw the day before, like it's either light throwing, like maybe forty-five feet, or maybe not even throw at all. Yeah. Day after Sunday would be like get back into it, throw a little farther, um, start to I don't know, get that blood flowing again get ready to go almost like it's stage one to get ready for the next start. Um, and then Monday will be day before a bullpen to where I'm, I don't know, probably stretching out a little bit, get up to 200 feet, like light, long toss Tuesday bullpen, just light 20, 25 pitches. Um, Wednesday would be 90 feet typically um thursday also around 90 feet nothing too strenuous sometimes stretch out to 120 and then friday game okay so it's really like one bullpen in between the rest of the days you're kind of just tossing around yeah staying loose and then you're ready to go for friday yeah what i do want to start doing is getting off the mound more 
not necessarily a bullpen, but playing catch on a mound, I think is really beneficial because I think like if you're throwing off mound in game, like don't you want to replicate that as much as you can to where like your motion, you're like your, your motion when playing catch, like on a flat ground in the outfield, it's going to be a slightly different than when you're playing catch on a mound because you have that slope, which like takes a pretty large effect. And I think like the more you can play off, play catch off the mound, more like repeatable your delivery is going to be ultimately more command, more consistency you're going to have. Absolutely. That, that just makes sense. Yeah. And then are you a cold plunger? Do you do the sauna? Have you tried any of those types of things with recovery yet? No, I'm big on like rolling out, like everything post throw, post workout, um, maintaining mobility, lots of stretches pre and post workout and bullpen and catch play all that. Um, but as far as a cold plunge and all that, haven't quite been introduced to that, but I, I, I assume I will be at some yeah. point. Yeah. Mick Abel went to Jesuit as well. And I believe you were a freshman when he was a senior Yeah, and he was selected 15th overall in the draft of that year. Were you on varsity freshman year and were you able to take some out of seeing Mick Abel close up? Uh, unfortunately I wasn't varsity freshman year. I was, yeah, like I, like I said earlier, I was six foot 145 throwing like 74 miles an hour or 77 miles an hour or whatever it was. Like I, I wasn't quite varsity material. Yeah, I, I was a solid freshman, I'd say. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, we we had a couple freshmen who are now playing off collegi- uh, collegiately. Like we had three freshmen total play on JV, and our JV and varsity practiced together all the time. We had varsity field and our freshman field. Like it was mm-hmm. just separated in two when we had three teams. So those guys who played JV now, um, they got a chance to see Mick. I think a couple of them got to face him. Um, but yeah, they're all playing at ones at U of O, Ryan Cooney, one's at Oregon State, Levi Jones, and one's at um Michigan, Brock Light Like our our that 2023 class for Jesuit was ridiculous because on top of those three, we had me who was going to U of O and then eventually got drafted. We had Ty Alman who's at Santa Clara, um another guy going to Regis in Colorado. Uh, Chapman in California, um, Pomona Pitzer in California. Like, it, it was a ridiculous class. I think, what was that? Six? No. I think five going D1 and then eight going collegiately, all in one class, which Man. is absurd. What was your regular season record as a team? Were you undefeated in, in the regular season? We lost two games. Uh, if you don't count that tournament out in carolina we lost two games to teams in oregon and then lost the state championship but as as far as the state championship tournament we mercy ruled every team except for the semifinals and and we lost state championship but man yeah we were i don't i don't think oregon will see a class like that because that that team or just a team like that with what because we had not only only that, but we had a, at the time, sophomore, now junior, committed to Gonzaga. We have a kid who's now a senior who's committed to Hawaii. I think another one committed to Portland. I'm not entirely sure about that. But, like, it, it that that team was, I don't know. That, I don't think high school baseball was ready for that team. Yeah, man. And then uh, do, you, do you recall how you guys did against Paul Wilson that year? Never played him, unfortunately. Oh, you but, guys didn't play? No, we did uh, my junior year, 2022, and we won 2-0 on two solo home runs. Man. From yeah, we <laughs> that game is funny because I was so I was batting third, and our our leadoff was the University of Oregon guy. Our two hitter was the Oregon State guy, and the Oregon State guy is a lefty, Levi Jones. Um, Levi gets first pitch fastball, kind of like middle away, and just taps it. Or not taps it, he hit it pretty well. But hit, <laughs> hits it for a home or no, his middle end gets jammed and still hits it for a home run, like in left center. And very next pitch was so Paul had topped out at ninety five before that. Very next pitch was to me high and away at ninety six miles an hour. His new new personal best out of rage. <laughs> and then yeah. I, I I walked on five pitches. So I got on, I can say that. Um, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that that game was 
definitely interesting. And I don't know how many people know this, but you know, you mentioned that you also hit, you played first base from, from the sounds of it. Yeah. You batted 373 with five home runs and 27 RBIs as a first baseman your senior year on top of being this top pitching prospect. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess what was that like being able to hit your senior year? You obviously tore it up and just that experience. Yeah, uh, my I would consider my senior year uh, not quite as good as my junior year because junior year I was like 470 with like four home runs, but I'm just a ton of doubles. But yeah, it was I was obviously a little more focused on doing both junior year, but senior year like it was really like okay, I'm a pitcher, like that's kind of decided. Um, but yeah, like I got to still have a chance to focus on hitting. Like I wanted, I wanted to win. And I think that being able to hit is obviously going to be a large factor to contributing towards the team. And like, especially when I'm pitching, like I want to be able to mercy a team. So that way I <laughs> keep the bullet count in my arm a little higher. Right. Don't throw as much, but um, yeah. And then you trained at the Roke, uh, from what I've heard with uh, Paul Wilson and some other guys. I heard that Adley Rutschman trains there. Yeah. So what was it like to be able to train at a facility like that with the trainers there, those other high-tier players? Yeah, it's great. Uh, they had what was called the Elite Group, uh, which was kind of like the top high school baseball players in the state. And um, there was like, what? three guys from Jesuit and then Paul and a couple other guys from uh, Lake Ridge where he went and a guy from Tiger. Like it was a handful of guys, all guys that want to get better. And that was, I think one of the most kind of, I don't know, important parts of like my career is joining like Roke because I got way stronger. I got way quicker. I was moving way better uh, and put on a lot of muscle. And ultimately that it really helped me be able to like strengthen like my mechanics and work on like finding that the mechanics that work for me because I was able to have my body coordinate enough to know what I'm doing in my motion. And I think that is like probably the biggest factor in like my development. Were you able to pitch to Adley at all or have you met Adley? I've met Adley uh, a couple of times. I worked out with that group. Uh, over the winter while I was back in Oregon. Um, yeah, Adley, Paul was in that group. Mick, uh, Dylan McLean, a, a Central Catholic, a um, handful of other guys that I got to meet for the first time there. But yeah, really, really cool. Carson Kelly, name another. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it was, yeah. They, they definitely know what they're doing there. Yeah. So what's your most memorable uh baseball experience in your career so far oh um most memorable would be probably pitching out in carolina uh, oh i guess if the draft if you count that <laughs> but i guess that's you forgot about that part you blacked that's out an, that's an offspring <laughs> of baseball like that as far as playing baseball probably pitching out in north carolina because like gotta bring the high school the whole the high school team was there uh they're awesome. They're a second family. Uh, so to go take a trip to us out of the country and play baseball with them, like that, that, that was just, it's just an awesome experience. And pitching in that game, like facing the number one team, lots of hype around it, tons of scouts in the stands because their pitcher now at Arkansas, Hunter Dietz, he's going to be high draft pick his junior year. They had, they had like a ridiculous team. And I don't know that something about that was just, I don't know. It was best baseball. I think I've played. Yeah. Different environment being away yeah. from home, you know, across the country to where, you know, in the South baseball is a huge sport and a lot of yeah. talent down there. Who is your favorite big leaguer currently? And then who do you see yourself as, I guess we already covered profile wise, you're kind of Jacob deGrom, but who's your favorite big leaguer currently that you're watching and th that you watch most? Big leaguer currently, uh, the Mariner fan in me says Julio Rodriguez. There I you think, go. yeah, when um, I don't know, seeing him and the rest of the team go to the playoffs in 22, I think that that was, I don't know, the kid in me was jumping up and down. Um, but like, I guess pitcher, probably Jacob Degrom. He's just like smooth, 
102, like kind of, kind of built similarly. Up. Yeah, like uh, that's it's just always fun to watch when he's on the mound, just dominating, dissecting everybody. Like he he pitches like he's almost like he throws like low 90s, like he has to be crafty, like just to get people off balance. But then it's 98 to 101 consistently with a ton of carry. He's missing bats every time. It's like what? 13 strikeouts per night every every single outing like it's it's just so fun to watch when you're able to dot up 102 at the knees on that lower outside corner it's ridiculous yeah you have, then that's when you get all the guys swinging over that slider because you have to be able to protect against that you have, you have no yeah. chance it's unfair yeah did you go to that uh mariners playoff game in 22 i wish no i didn't okay who are you most excited to play with in the, in the coming years um, I mean, in the upcoming years, I would say Thomas, because I think Thomas and I are probably on a very similar track to just for the future. And I think kind of seeing his development and just working with him, that's, it's going to be very fun and very exciting. Um, but as far as somebody like I want to play against, like say the major leagues, uh, play with, I mean, I got to meet Arias once at the all-star game. I'd be really cool to play with him or to pitch against someone like Acuna like that. That's obviously probably one of the tougher challenges, but I think it'll be, I mean, why not challenge myself? Yeah. Right. Playing in the yeah. NL East, you'll see some of those guys. That'll be yeah. some good matchups. And then what's your favorite thing to do outside of baseball? Who are you outside of the field? What do you do to relax and de-stress? Um, just play video games, hang out with my friends, or I guess play video games with my friends read watch movies watch tv shows like all that just kind of I, I i would say i'm a pretty decent movie buff okay do you have like a top five i do blade runner 2049 the prestige um what is it what was next ford versus ferrari the original blade runner and then um seven seven yeah yeah, you got that list dialed in, and the Prestige, that's from like 10 years ago, right? Yeah, that's an incredible movie. Awesome. Well, uh, Noble, really appreciate you taking the time today. Uh, it's been great getting to know you a little bit. Best of luck this year, and yeah, from all of us baseball fans, the Marlins fans out there, thank you for your time, and we look forward to seeing you out on the field. Yeah, thank you for having me. Through the first five hitters. Slider, the change, the quick pitch.